political upheaval. Geopolitical tensions. Changes in trade patterns. Impacting on financial flows. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, lovely to see so many of you here for our session today. I hope you enjoyed that Blade Runner introduction. The only fear of my illustrious panel here is that they will underperform the kind of uh, son and lumiere and CGI that you've just seen, but I have no such fears because we do have such a fascinating subject in front of us today. Uh, I'm Anne McElvoy. I'm senior editor at The Economist. I run Economist Radio and I make some shows for the BBC as well. My panel have got such a cornucopia of expertise between them, I want to introduce them separately in just a moment. But let's just remind ourselves what question we have before us, and we want to pull you in to responding as well. So, uh, yeah, public service announcement first. We will be taking questions and doing a couple of polls. You can see that this is our nifty way of making sure you're all still awake. But in fact, with such a lot of knowledge in the room, it would be a bit of a shame to waste it, wouldn't it? So to participate, please go to your Cybos app and select Plenary. Alternatively, you can go to sli.do slash cybos in your browser and enter today's access code date to cybos 2017 and submit your questions. That way, if you've understood all that, you're clearly already running a major company. Um, we are going to, I think, start with a, a, a question which we, we might sort of pop up uh, just to get your responses. Here we go. All buttons at, at, at the ready. Could we pop up this question behind us? Yes. Um, whenever you're ready to vote, I think we can leave it up for, for a little while, but whenever you're ready to vote, I should probably come back to it in uh, maybe five, ten minutes. If you're already voting away, we might get a, a decent result. We'll, we'll take another look at it in probably five minutes, just in case anyone else is twiddling for the buttons. What keeps you awake at night? We know the answer is really your teenage children. Uh, but uh, given that, that they're not covered here, what else? When, you're, when you finish worrying about your teenage children and the dog, it keeps you up at night. Right. But nation-first politics and the impact that they're having on the way to what looks like a we response sorry, to what looks like a very topsy-turvy world at times. Disruptions to those expensively prepared economic models. Political events, I happen to be a political journalist by a lot of my trade, that seem to form part of a trend that shakes the certainties of elites and leaves daunting questions in politics, business and beyond, whether it's Brexit in the UK, the election of Donald Trump, people power often delivering results that many did not predict and struggle to deal with. Let's remind ourselves also further afield of what's been happening. We've seen an unexpected turn of events in France, a challenge to the sedate power of Angela Merkel in Germany, a ministerial reshuffle in India, and as we speak, the Chinese Communist Party's 19th Congress is getting underway. Some of us here on the platform thought it was very nice of President Xi to agree to hold it just after we got going here in Toronto at, at Cyber so that we could look at it afresh. Just a few pointers for what we'd, we'd like our panel to discuss. Domestic reforms in the US and how these will impact internationally, particularly in finance and trade. How Brexit's exodus from the EU will unfold which of those trade agreements, which we can't decide whether are hard, soft, poached or scrambled, will be ditched, negotiated or renegotiated? Panel, keep a few of these in your minds. And of course, you can't separate this from the broader geopolitical tensions, particularly those on the Korean Peninsula at the moment, and the roles of China and India. So let me tell you who we have to discuss all this with you. To my immediate left, your immediate right, Philippe Lacour, Senior Fellow with the Harvard Kennedy School Center for Business and Government, formerly at the Brookings Institution in Washington, and also a former Special Assistant for International Affairs to the French Defense Ministry. So he brings a good range. Oh, and he was also a former journalist, which of course always uh, warms the heart of a, a journalist chair, but no fear and no favors. His uh, latest book is China's Offensive in Europe, published by Brookings. And next to Philippe is Heather McGregor, Executive Dean of the Edinburgh Business School, the Graduate School, 
of Harriet Watt University, also the owner of a global headhunting firm. She's better known to some of us as Mrs. Moneypenny, writing for a long time in the FT. No, not James Bond's diary planner, sadly. Although she does so many other things, she could probably knock that off on the side, now doing a, a, a weekly column for the BBC World Service. Tim Adams is currently Professor and CEO of the Institute of International Finance. Tim is next to me. Hello, Tim. Previously Under Secretary for International Affairs at the US Department of Treasury and the administration's point person on international financial issues. Tanvi Madan is Fellow and Director of the India Project at Brookings. Tanvi, hello. Her work explores Indian foreign policy, particular relations with China. Absolutely crucial a field of play at the moment and the US. She's working on a book on the US-India relationship and she has also looked at the Modi government's China policy. We will come to her a little later on. Philippe has uh, offered to get us underway with a, a bit of a, a global tour. Philippe. Well, thank you very much, Anne. Very impressive to be sitting uh, in between these uh, very well-known ladies. Um, I mean, as you say, Anne, this is, this is a great timing for, for us to, to talk about geopolitics uh, uh, a day before the 19th Party Congress uh, uh, opens in, in, in Beijing. Uh, not that it's going to change very much in terms of uh, uh, the democratic life uh, of the world, uh, but, but certainly President Xi Jinping will be reappointed for another five years. And, and, and the peculiar aspect of this uh, party congress is that, of course, nobody knew the date, so uh, uh, too bad for, for, uh, for, for Cybos, who was trying to, to get uh, organized, uh, depending on this, on this congress. But um, also, we don't know who, who the leaders will be uh, um, uh, a week from now, except for President Xi himself. But one thing we know for sure is that China has become central to a lot of things in, in today's words. And, and, and the party documents for, for the first time are really referring uh, uh, to China's role in the world. It's not just you know, domestic issues, it's also China's impact. And in fact, China is the, is the one country that's, that has been benefiting a lot from the, the decline of, of the uh, Anglosphere, perhaps, uh, talking about uh, Mr. Trump's election uh, just about a year ago, and, and also Brexit. I mean, think about it. Uh, uh, a year ago, uh, a man who had no experience in politics got elected president of the, of the United States. Uh, uh, think about it. In, in, in the UK, a prime minister called David Cameron uh, um, uh, called for a referendum and lost it. The next day was out. Think about it. Prime Minister May was still, in, still prime minister uh, uh, for, for another few days. Um, uh, uh, you know, brought, uh, I mean, organized a general election and lost it. Um, and I mean, if you, if you, if some of you might know Ai Weiwei, the, 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 the Chinese uh, dissident who was just giving an interview a few days ago, I mean, was basically saying that, that, that the West has become a, a, a laughing stock. Uh, uh, and, and fortunately, our, our democracies have become uh, uh, a laughing stock, uh, according to the, the, the Chinese uh, leaders. So, how is China uh, uh, playing an active role in today's world? Well, first, by, by playing the game, by being involved in international institutions, in the United Nations, in the WTO, uh, in the international financial system, the World Bank, the IMF, um, taking control of, of things uh, in, in, in many ways. Um, and, you know, impacting them, as, as we heard from Xi Jinping's speech at Davos early this year, which was a pretty significant uh, speech, as presenting China as a big player in today's world. At the same time, it is shaping things by, uh, by creating new institutions. So one of them is the Asian uh, um, Investment Infrastructure uh, Bank, which is, you know, it set up two years ago. Another one is a more vague concept called the, the Belt and Road Initiative, uh, which is this, this sort of grant, uh, uh, I mean, the New Silk Road, you might call it, uh, that is basically aiming at, at, at building infrastructures, you know, uh, across Central Asia, Iran, uh, um, um, the, the, the former Soviet space, uh, all the way to Europe. But it's now en encompassing, you know, Africa, Latin America, you name it. I mean, this is a very smart way to, 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 to present an alternative uh, to the Western-led international 
uh, order. Uh, a pro-globalization um, order, but also a less liberal order in, in political uh, Terms. And that leads, of course, to the question of populism. Uh, uh, and, and in many ways, I mean, China's, it, it, does China's rise lead to more populism in, in the West? It, you know, it's an open question. It's not, China is not really uh, an issue in, in, in democratic elections. It wasn't an issue in, in any of the, uh, of the countries I've referred to. But at the same time, there is some um, uh, um, discussions in the West about, uh, uh, about screening some of the Chinese investments in high tech, in, you know, in, 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 um, in some of them in infrastructures, port, airport facilities, and things like that. People are starting to ask, you know, is China's market as open as our market? Um, do, we, do we access to, to the Chinese market uh, as much as, as we want? In fact, your, your very uh, own uh, newspapers, The Economist, asked the question, does China play fair? Yeah. Uh, I mean, it used to be a low-cost economy, and it is now, you know, clearly uh, the, the, num the world number two economy. And, and at the same time, it, it, I mean, there's, there's much less foreign investments than there used to be, and China is becoming gradually the world's uh, uh, number one uh, investor. So uh, my answer to this is that, uh, first of all, we, we, we can do nothing about China being a global player. Uh, this is part of life, and, and, uh, and we should welcome it in a way. But at the same time, we have to keep in mind that this is a country uh, that uses state aid and, and that uses a, a single party rule, and we'll hear about it from tomorrow <laughs> for the next 10 days. <laughs> um, you know, it, it, it's the biggest uh, uh, um, you know, a political party in the world, I guess, and it will be celebrating its uh, 100th anniversary in three years from now. Um, and, and, you know, whether we want this party and these states to play a role in our economies, um, uh, not always playing fairly, um, uh, is an open question. Uh, and, 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 and my work at, at Harvard is, is, is about really this geopolitical rise of China, uh, geoeconomic mainly, whether it leads to, to mm. you know, a political influence. We might well come, come back to that. And you've written a, a fascinating piece uh, in the last week so suggesting that perhaps the EU and others need to sort of band together much more on a response to China. I might like to put you on the spot a bit later, perhaps uh, with others on the panel, about how that could work in, in practice. But uh, Heather, you, you, you also have not only a, a global overview, but you are, and it is just a remarkable thing to get an academic who actually runs a, a, a major company. So you're seeing it from both ends uh, of the telescope. How does this topsy-turvy world strike you? Um, Yes, well, I mean, particularly, of course, uh, the topsy-turvy world, which has such a big effect on financial services, where we're, uh, we're all, um, one way or another, earn a living. Uh, interestingly, when I, uh, when I took over at the Edinburgh Business School earlier this year, uh, one of the first uh, moves I did was to reappoint Sir David Lee, who's the chairman and chief executive of the Bank of East Asia, as one of my visiting professors, um, uh, because even though he's... Um, you know, he's got a seven in front of his age, and uh, he has managed to open over a hundred new branches in China uh, over the last five years. And although, you know, th there is a very conservative regime in China, it gives the it gives the appearance of being a very open uh, one, and, and and it encourages its friends to uh, to develop and invest in it. Um, and, and and also, you know, it, it, the whole axis is still tilting. It may feel like a bit, you know, last year's. Uh, thinking to think about Asia, but I have learned in a very personal way to think about Asia's power. Um, it, it is inconceivable when I went to work for the Financial Times um, in 1999, at which time I was living and working in Tokyo. And it was inconceivable that one day the person that owned the Financial Times might be a workers' cooperative in Tokyo, uh, which now and now the Nikkei owns the Financial Times. Um, and, and in Scotland, you know, we're very proud in Scotland of our businesses. We're very proud of our technology businesses. And yet, you know, our biggest single uh, start from scratch technology business, Skyscanner, was recently bought by the Chinese. Good. So it's, it, it's a, it, you know, it's really bringing it home to, to you. To Philippe's point, huh? At a very, very personal level. Mm. So, and, and I would just finish by saying that, um, you know, what's the reaction going to be of some of these very teethless governments that are sitting around in the more Western part of the world. And I'll tell you what I think their reaction's gonna be. You know, when in doubt, 
bash a banker. Okay? When in doubt, when you want to get a vote, bash a banker. And the, the, what you find is things like the senior manager's regime, which is, for those of you who are unfamiliar with it, we won't you know, send you to sleep on the spot, but it's a, uh, a new rule that's come in to make people accountable because the British public are really fed up, or at least the readers of the Daily Mail, are really fed up that not a single banker has gone to prison as a result of the, the crash in 08, 09. And so they've brought in something called the senior manager's regime to make sure that next time round people will go to prison. Um, and... Just like the worst case of bird flu, okay, these kind of things have dreadful creep around the world. So now Australia's putting one in. And you watch, it'll be here, it'll be in America, and it'll be in Canada. In another two minutes, you just watch. There is this contagious creep of terrible legislation um, that creeps around the world, which is a direct result of toothless governments trying to do something to make themselves feel important again. That's them told. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Before I just go to the other side of the, the, the panel, pick up on toothlessness and what, where, where teeth are appropriate and, and possibly where not. Um, could we just flick up our question? I think you've all had time to work out what you're worried about, haven't you? If you, if you haven't worked it out by now. Well, there you go. Wash. <laughs> it's, uh, I think in the, in the European Vision Song Contest, you say it's a clear douze point, isn't it? Um, and it's very obvious there that the 43% goes to US politics. Cyber risk. Anyone on the panel think that comes higher than they expected coming in there? 33%? Did you all expect that to come so high? I'm not surprised to see Brexit so far down. It's a real rounding error in the world of risk. Mm -hmm. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, Brexit, either it's going to go better uh, than a lot of the pessimists think, or people haven't woken up yet. That's uh, possibly true. But it's, I'm very interested in how much uh, cyber risk sh showed up there. So that's possibly given us something perhaps to focus a little bit more on up here. Thank you very much for that. Now, Tim, uh, president and uh, what is it? president of toothlessness, that's not quite <laughs> what I meant to say was that that charge of toothless governments. Uh, Interesting. You served in a major government. You have teeth. You're at the Institute of International, International Finance now. I'll put my own teeth back in there. International Finance now. Uh, interesting whether that's a fair criticism of governments, but I think the challenge that Heather was laying down is one that flows throughout the, the financial debate. Yeah, uh, in Washington, it's not toothless. It has fangs, which is very different. And if, I, you know, I agree with the, the, the survey. Uh, you should have a front row seat. It's fascinating. It reminds me of the Napoleon Bonaparte quote that says, absurdity in politics is no handicap because we have absurdity on a daily basis. And what we have is an era of neo-mercantilism where institutional frameworks are being dismantled and the administration is withdrawing. Just last week, they withdrew from the JPCOA, uh, the Iran Iranian deal, or essentially began the process, uh, withdrawal from UNESCO. Uh, NAFTA is being negotiated. If the US withdraws, it's sort of the Brexit of North America. And so the institution, the post-war institutional framework is, is, is uh, under tatters. So th th this administration is an inflection point, as was the great financial crisis. And both of those component pieces magnifying one another has impacts on where we organize ourselves financially, uh, Cross-border uh, financial flows have never really recovered much since the financial crisis. Certainly banking flows, FDI has never recovered. They may tell us something about uh, supply line development. Uh, and what we do see is a shifting away from G20, intra-G20 flows to more south-south flows. And since getting around uh, Europe and the US and parts of, uh, of East Asia. so. We're seeing greater protectionism, localization, greater fragmentation and balkanization. We see it in the regulatory structure, regulatory discussions. It's an end of, of financial globalization. That great era that existed from the mid-70s till about uh, the mid-2007, uh, 2008. Irrevocably? No, I, well, you can do, we'll see how much damage they do. You know, the, the infrastructure's there. It really requires the leadership. Without leadership, you have nothing. Macron and others, I think, uh, continue to believe in this system. But when you have the U.S. willing to walk away and saying we're going to take our marbles and go home, 
it could do irreparable damage. It depends on how long they're, they're in position of authority. I have just a question which comes back to the, the title of our, our discussion, which sort of side, uh, sort of asked us to discuss, was Nation First Politics. So a lot of people discuss populism as if it were essentially a political or an economic trend. Mm -hmm. How much do you think, and this is really this interesting bridge that you represent between government and finance and a lot of jobs that people in the audience uh, and at the conference do, is there a way in which these things can still be decoupled, i.e. capital flows, trade flows, might still be more robust than that more inward-looking nation-driven politics suggests? You know, it's very difficult. I, I dislike the word populism because it's been used to describe everything from Chavez and Peron to Donald Trump to the uh, alternative for uh, Deutschland. And putting all of them in one box is really hard. I, it's I, a magic mix. It is. And I think you've got to look beneath it and understand what's really going on, how much it is uh, uh, anti-immigration and uh, xenophobia, nationalism. You know, what's driving this component pieces? And I tell you something about the greater complexity of, of the challenges. I do think on capital flows, it does pose a problem, unlike what the business many of you are in, which is digital flows. There, we're, being, we're still becoming increasingly connected you know, zeros and ones in the digital world we live in still is crossing borders. We do have localization requirements. We have data privacy challenges. As someone said the other day, data is the new oil. And if governments find ways to put up firewalls and privacy requirements mm. and localization requirements, it could create the kind of inflexibility and constraints that we see on capital. Let's uh, get a word then for, from Tanvi, and then we can come to perhaps uh, unpacking some of, uh, of those things and a little bit of what we saw behind us. I know that you, you deal both with India and China, but you also have the Washington perspective, happily for us, you know, with that, that nice uh, 360 view that you have there from Brookings. We haven't touched so much on India as we've gone along. Do you think that that's because that's what, how it happens? We go across the, the world and then India sometimes gets sort of pinned on as an afterthought. I think that's one reason, but I think the other reason is if you think about it, in some ways, India is almost um, an island of stability amongst all this uncertainty. Uh, you have uh, a prime minister who, on the one hand, is perhaps at the peak of his political power, uh, an economy that, while growth has slowed down, is still one of the fastest growing uh, emerging economies in the world, um, and a prime minister who isn't just kind of at, at his, the peak of his political power, uh, but has a, a status on the world stage and is part of these discussions in a way uh, the recent prime ministers haven't been. Having said that, all this that we were talking about affects India deeply. And Prime Minister Modi's choices in terms of what he can achieve as well, uh, India's economy is highly connected to the world's economy. And so the big questions for him, if, if I asked him, you know, what keeps you awake at night, he's, he allegedly doesn't sleep very much as it is, but if you think about um, you know, what keeps him awake at night, I would say at home, uh, first and foremost, uh, it's re-election. He's got a re-election coming up or an election coming up in May 2019 or by t May 2019. And one of the things he's going to grapple with is how are all these developments abroad going to affect his choices at home in terms of making sure that he goes into that election with the best possible, uh, with the best possible at, uh, wicket. Uh, and he might even call elections early. Why does this matter to an audience like you? Uh, because those, his desire to get re-elected is going to, over the next 18 months, um, affect the economic choices he makes. Um, is he going to recapitalize the banks that have $150 billion uh, worth of kind of bad loans on their books? Or is he going to go for a stimulus program in rural areas with kind of the implications that that has uh, for India's fiscal picture? Um, but on the other hand, I mean, re-election is a short-term issue, and these economic choices, it also has an impact on India's trade policy. I think in the kind of longer term, his big challenge is how do you create jobs? Um, and that uh, was very much supposed to be part of kind of the world helping out. Uh, he has to create over the next 10 years, or any Indian government, about a million jobs a month for the next 10 years. Uh, that is the big challenge. And at abroad, when he's sitting and looking at the world, it's one of the most uncertain periods uh, that India has seen. Because the question is, for a country that has benefited from the rules-based international order, even though India didn't have a role in writing many of the rules, uh, we have questions about that, 
But on the other hand, the question, next question is, who is going to write the new rules? Mm. Uh, is it going to be China? And in Asia, that is, that is the big challenge for Prime Minister Modi. He wants to take advantage of China's economy. He wants to benefit from Chinese investment. But geopolitically, it's a very tense relationship. Economically, it's a tense uh, relationship. India has a huge trade deficit with China. But something that Philippe mentioned, and I'll end with that, which is when you think about something like the Belt and Road Initiative, what it is part of is uh, uh, China rewriting uh, the map of Asia. It's not just China doing it. Japan has its own plans. India has its own plan. But the question is, uh, China, which India has a difficult relationship, if China is the one rewriting rules at a time uh, when India is very uncertain about the U.S., which it is a major partner of, um, is what does this mean for India's options? India wants to see a multipolar world and a multipolar Asia. China wants to see a multipolar world but a unipolar Asia. That doesn't sound like it's going to live happily together. Uh, no, I'm afraid not. <laughs> A few uh, good questions have, have come in. So uh, with a view very much panel to you coming in and having a discussion uh, around this. Let me just uh, kick off with, with, with one, uh, which feels like it's got Philip's name badge right on it. Why is China always considered the bad guy in the league, given that I suppose that other countries also in terms of trade policy and have a tendency to sign up to rules and then avoid them? Do you believe that China, is it only because of its size that you, you, you think there is a particular focus to, to this, or do you think it's because of the way that China behaves? Well, I mean, China, I mean, 35 years ago was this great place where you could, you know, go and, and invest in low costs, you know, um, 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 manufacturing. Um, and, you know, all our multinationals are basically responsible for China's situation now. So I'm not saying, you know, it wasn't a bad guy 35 years ago, and, 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 and it's, it, it, it's still not a bad guy. Uh, uh, the problem is, again, the question is, does it play by, by the rules? And of course, uh, there comes to mind uh, intellectual property issues, uh, you know, counterfeiting, uh, respecting WTO rules of which China is a member, um, cyber issues. Um, um, but again, uh, the issue of competition and, 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 and state aid, I think, uh, is, is dominant there. Because at the end of the day, uh, when you have state-owned enterprises investing around the world with state-owned banks, I'm sorry, I realize this is a banker's uh, uh, a meeting, um, it, it, it does, and, and, and you know, state-owned sovereign funds, of course, it does, it does make a difference, it does have an impact. Now, obviously, this has translated into, into some job creations, I mean, Tenvi mentioned job creations. I think this is one of the key issues of today's world, really. I mean, everybody, every leader in the world, whether it's Prime Minister Modi or, or President Xi or President Macron, I mean, they're all trying to get jobs for their new jobs for the economy. Now, if everybody plays by the rules, of course, it's going to work out, but I'm not so sure about that. I mean, President Trump is also trying to to, uh, to create jobs by, by uh, building walls and things mm -hmm. like that. Uh, we'll see where that goes. Um, so, you know, as long as we establish rules that, that everybody follows, uh, that the, including the WTO rules, um, um, including when you, when you, you know, invest in a country, um, and, and, and if, if your market is equally open, I think there's, there's not a problem. It's not a problem but, but, about uh, guys. Can I just throw that to Tim and ask that? It sounds, and forgive me if it's a slight caricature, saying, well, as long as you do what, you know, what we all thought was sensible before that is now being disrupted, mm -hmm. everything will be fine. But it isn't, because it has been disrupted. So what would be the levers that you feel you know, that the policymakers pull, the, the, the right kind of, of teeth to you know, take on the, the, the theme that Heather set running a bit earlier that would make that deliverable without simply saying, wagging a finger at China and finding five years on, you'll no further down the road. Sure, well, it is a challenge. And it, ultimately, it's in China's best interest to, uh, to protect intellectual property rights, right? Because without, without that kind of protection, then you essentially constrain domestic innovation. But, you know, they, there is huge and wide-sweeping violations of, of intellectual property. How many firms if you talk to, maybe in this, in this um, room, where you've done a joint venture with not only in China, but other places, and you find the technology walks out the back door and it goes down the street and it starts competing against you. 
And that simply is not sustainable. And that, and that is inconsistent with international norms and international laws. And where that happens, we should, uh, we should be aggressive. But ultimately, China has to, has to understand it's in their interest to have enforceable contracts, rule by law, and, and uh, protect intellectual property. When you talk about rule by law, actually, that's a, a, another question completely from a, a different angle, but it raises the same question, which is putting bankers in prison for breaking the law. If that's toothless, says Daniel in the audience, then what would qualify uh, as, as being a, a solid and well thought through solution to the kind of dissatisfactions which, after all, after the financial crisis, do seem to have driven a lot of the responses politically that are proving troublesome? I honestly think that if you want to see an example of strong government supporting, um, you know, a, a, a less uh, tempestuous financial sector, then I'd rather like China to step up to the plate and sort out North Korea. You know, I think sorting out North Korea would be a very much a better and a more powerful message to the world economy and to, the, the, you know, business likes consistency and business likes being able to uh, actually look forward with, with some degree of certainty, which is why Brexit is a nightmare. Um, and what, you know, I think that, you know, putting a few bankers in prison, which, you know, I'm I'm sure will happen, um, but what, what, can't, what means not being toothless? I want to see someone standing up to North Korea and sorting that out. And, you know, when China wants to, it, it, it plays a very powerful role. I've, I've spent a lot of time this year in Myanmar, which right now, of course, is in the headlines for all the wrong reasons. But if you can look beyond some of the human rights abuses are there, you've got a country of 60 million people, okay? So this is not some small country. It's growing at the rate of knots, and the only people that are putting any investment in there of any meaningful kind are number one China and number two Japan. But if you're concerned, and anyone on the panel, please, you know, jump in. If your big concern is, as a business is what's happening, Dodd-Frank, or how to assess and, and perhaps avoid the kind of risks that, that led to the trouble in the housing market that set off the many steps, you know, the, the want of a horseshoe nail that set off the financial crisis. Uh, arguing for someone to be tougher on North Korea might not be top of your to-do list, so what should be? Well, I don't know. That's pretty existential for parts of uh, maybe it's Toronto, maybe. Stop. <laughs> you know, you have, uh, you have a, uh, an individual who is determined to develop a nuclear program that has the capacity to strike North America, and they're pretty close to it if they don't already have it. Yeah, and you, and have you can undermine the, the whole States, financial he's, system. He's right not, that that's a red line. He's not going to allow it to happen. I don't know how this works out. I, I worry it works out badly. That worries me much more than whether the Basel Committee is going to get uh, well, Basel done. What worries done me is somebody month. sitting in Florida sending out tweets might set off some complete disaster for the rest of the world, which is going to undermine any possible financial system we have. And I, the president's going to China. I hope that we see it. I agree with you that, that Beijing takes the North Korea threat seriously and begins to turn the screws. If not, we have a president who could potentially do something. He's determined to be unpredictable and unpredictability uh, ends up creating potentially huge existential uh, challenges. Let's not forget that beside the geopolitical challenges, cybersecurity scored high on, on the worry list that, that we saw at the beginning. Uh, how, many, how many of you are, have changed the, the way that you think about cybersecurity as kind of part of, of the way that you look at business and, and finance? Does it, is it as high on your list of concerns as it was for the audience, or at least those who managed to get to the, the app and vote? I think it's going to be one of those issues which across the board, whether you're looking at business, finance, geopolitics, the North Korea issue, the fact that we think about its nuclear weapons, but we need to start thinking about its cyber weapons. But this is across, even in politics today, um, uh, one of the key issues in US politics, for example, is the vulnerability of the system. If you look at a country like India, which is increasingly digitizing everything from its electoral system to its subsidy reform system, um, it's all dependent on a network that we haven't, I think, thought through vulnerabilities as much, uh, but also things like resilience and responses to crises. Um, how do you deal with them? Uh, who's writing the rules of even th that kind of uh, set of issues? Uh, these uh, issues are going to come up again and again in pretty much every sphere that we can think of. Yeah, I mean, I, I totally agree. I mean, the, the, the word is shifting with now new players coming up 
mainly from Asia. Uh, some bad guys, like North Korea, <laughs> no doubt, uh, who has been hacking um, you know, the US, for mm -hmm. example. Uh, but but some some players also, also coming out of China and you know e-commerce is becoming really one of China's trademarks, um, and 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 the West is sort of catching up. You know it's uh, so this is this is really one of the new uh, aspects of our of of of, of, of our times is, is is that cyber is becoming so cyber security um, cyber espionage these aspects which which you know also are affect, affecting some of the least democratic countries but but surely the most vulnerable are, are the democracies because they are in a way an open system um, they i mean the, the the media are sort of somewhat weaker than they than they were um, and, and as we know, I mean, it started with WikiLeaks and, and all kinds of um, um, Snowden, um, you know, type, um, uh, who, who, who've really damaged the, 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 the way of, of, you know, informations are circulating. Um, so so my, my concern is that, the, 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 you know, the, um, it, I mean, the West in particular should, should react and, 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 and should, should find, you know, mechanisms to, to uh, prevent, um, um, you know, particularly uh, hacking. Let's uh, move on. I think it's a very good time, by the way, if we could just ping up our second question, just testing that you're all still with us here. And it's, it's a more forward-looking one, isn't it? So we could be having a look at it while we perhaps talk about something else. And it's where we expect the next great financial centre to be. Here it comes. Which city is going to displace London? Oh, I like the suppressed premise there. Anyway, <laughs> let's assume that London might still exist in some form. Which city is going to emerge as the next great financial centre? Frankfurt. None. That sounds like a happening place. Singapore, Shanghai, Paris, Chicago, Mumbai. And if we've missed one off, I'm sure you could let us know by saying you've forgotten about my because City, um, we've got a, a fairly strong voting already going on there for Frankfurt, but if you'd like to disagree, why don't we come back uh, on that. Brexit, I've got a couple of brexit -y questions. Uh, as we all know in Britain, if you say the word Brexit, you know, you've panelled each other's throats, usually for about three hours. So we're going to do it quite quickly. Will Britain regret Brexit was a nicely short question put to us. Shall we just go around the panels? Heather. It astonishes me that we're all spending quite so much time worrying about the, the succession from the European Union of a small group of islands off the north or west coast of France with particularly bad weather. I, I am... Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I've read, you know, I know that London is, is the financial centre of the world. I know I've been a huge uh, beneficiary of that. I spent a, a decade uh, working uh, for ABN AMRO before it was, it was bought by the Scots and then imploded. And um, I, I actually don't think th that uh, Brexit is going to matter in the end of the day. I think that we should just, you know, as I say, keep calm and carry on. Um, and what, I don't think there will ever be a back down from it because just like you were saying about Prime Minister Modi, what keeps him awake at night is, is votes and getting re-elected. Um, I, I think that it would, it's, too it's too big a political decision for any one person in the UK who wants to get re-elected to back down from it now. I think it's too late, it's all over. So the best thing we can do is try and modify the collateral damage and make sure that we, we move on to the next phase of our, of our nationhood in a manner that, that means that the least worst outcome. But for corporations and for banks, you know, capital is a truly international uh, 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 phenomena. It can move overnight. I don't think it's actually in the wrong run going to make very much difference at all. But we're never going back on it. I'm I did afraid. like the description of Britain, which after all is quite a big economy, as if it were the Faroe Islands. <laughs> it's, it's not quite I the Faroe Islands. I think you're being Islands. a bit unfair on, on the, the size of British GDP. No, but you know, you know what? We might end up like the Faroe Islands if uh, we don't get the right a kind of So Brexit you are, you are the Eeyores and Tiggers, definite Eeyore, an Eeyore on Brexit... Philippe, a yeah. pessimistic donkey for anyone who doesn't <laughs> happen to come from a, a world in which you yes, read, if you haven't read the Winnie the Pooh. Pooh he doesn't, it's a donkey that doesn't read world headlines. <laughs> it is not often that a great nation decides the game is over and relegates itself out of the top rank of economic and geopolitical players, says uh, someone called Dennis McShane, who probably you <laughs> disapprove with. 
Um, yeah. I mean, honestly, <laughs> I, I, it, it, I've spent many years in the UK and I love the place, I love the people, I love the tea. Um, but um, it, it is a sad uh, uh, situation with, with uh, to me, a country really withdrawing from the international stage by, by making this decision. Uh, and it's not, uh, it's nobody's fault, it's just the 51% of the people. Well, it's only not my fault. You, you know, didn't choose to go and live in an igloo. Yes, but the problem, if you look at from, from, from the US point of view or from the Chinese point of view, uh, you look at, you, you see a small island, you see, you see the Faroe Islands, I'm afraid, which is nice for for you know, sightseeing and and uh, and, and you see London as a, as a financial centre, no doubt. I'm not saying London will, will will go away, but but in terms of geopolitical weight, uh, that's the one I'm I'm worried about. The US view was cited there. Well, the, you know, you this administration is looking for friends, and they find friends in London. There's some hope for a US UK free trade agreement. I'd say that's 20 years from now. We, we can't. I don't know that we're neg going to negotiate any free trade deals anytime soon. I'm not sure the UK has the the capacity to negotiate anything in the near term. I was at a dinner with Chancellor Hammond last Friday evening. Mm -hmm. He spoke eloquently and passionately about maintaining this ecosystem of the financial services industry. I don't know. I think we're going to get a hard Brexit. I think they're running out of time. And I think all of our member firms are already starting to move people and move operations. Well, I just put you on the spot on hard Brexit. I would say that the, uh, despite the sort of many, you know, we, we run a slightly pantomime British politics at the moment, admittedly, but, but notwithstanding, there does seem to be appetite uh, to negotiate again seriously behind the scenes. Theresa May on a quite quiet a visit to, to Brussels, a new German government of some sort will come together. What makes you so sure that there won't be a deal first quarter to half of next year, which might be my we're, hunt. You can tell me I was all wrong afterwards. We're, we're running out of time. We have, my industry leaders tell me we have about six months to get to finalize some sort of deal where it allows them to make decisions that aren't... Uh, you know, immediate and capricious, I guess, in some ways. Unless you extend the transition time. You could. Which has been but, there. but the sooner they do that would be very, very helpful. And because if not, they'll just make irreversible decisions. You start moving operations to other places. Already, it's just the nature of the, the tone, just like in the U.S., the tone has had a uh, deleterious impact, I think, on the business community. That's an, an interesting point. Dan, widen this out for us because, mm -hmm. you know, pro and con Brexit is something we could, uh, you know, we could, we could all, all, all do. But we saw it had relatively low salience up there in terms of actual concerns or perhaps uh, business decisions at the moment. When you look at it from turn the world around a bit, look at it perhaps from an Asian perspective, does it matter as much as we think? I think it, it does matter in the sense, I think it depends on the country um, that you're asking, but if you think about it from the Asian perspective, you know, Japan's gone ahead um, and signed a deal uh, with the EU. Um, you have China that I actually think will be more interested and perhaps Britain will be more interested in China because it is one of the countries uh, that is uh, looking for those connections. Uh, India, on the other hand, they would like Britain to get on with it and decide what Britain's going to do. Um, it's been a traditional partner, but I will say that what Brexit has done is changed the terms in terms of the attitude towards Britain in the sense of uh, you can't come here, as Prime Minister made it uh, to India in October last year, and demand a trade deal unless you give us something that we want. In India's mm -hmm. case, that's labor market access, and that's which she market. cannot give. And so that's a bit of a challenge. But that's, she's in a bit of a cleft stick there. Absolutely. If she gives it, if she extends the EU access, mm -hmm. she's accused of not respecting the result of the, the referendum. Well, as you say, you know, perhaps we also need to keep labor markets open it, far beyond Europe. What it has done is create an opportunity for Europe, I think, in a number of different ways. Uh, India, for example, is taking yeah. in, uh, both because of the US uh, and what's happening there and uh, Brexit, is taking another look at its relationship with the EU and particularly kind of the big European countries. How interesting. And Madonna's moved to Portugal. <laughs> so there you go. <laughs> I just, if you want to be ahead of the trend, Portugal is definitely uh, where it's at if you if you follow Madonna. I think we just do need to move on from Brexit. I'm aware that the, the, the clock is is relentless. You'll have seen, can we just flash up that uh, result again? It was Frankfurt, wasn't it? Oh, some people were off to Singapore. So 45% Frankfurt. This must be the nightlife. Uh, <laughs> that's, that's why it's not. <laughs> 
Frank Frankfurt speak up here. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure some, uh, you know, someone from sort of Frankfurt will, will uh, now come gunning for me in the lunch break. Singapore, 22%. Non, 15%. Well, uh, uh, the Shanghai, uh, 11. Would you agree with that, Philip, as a China expert well, on the panel? Well, the, th the thing is, of course, it depends a, a lot on, on, on how open China will become financially okay. and whether the internationalization of the RMB will, will carry on uh, and whether the, the debt issue, which is num number one priority for the, for the new uh, uh, Politburo, newly elected Politburo, um, um, uh, will, be, will be sorted out. Um, um, and, and Shanghai has the shape of a financial uh, center. Does it have the, the heart uh, of a financial center? Uh, I, I, I'm not sure. For the reasons that I explained in my introductory remarks, whether you know, China is the country that wants to open its doors to uh, uh, people like yourselves, um, and, and whether the, the banking uh, sector will open up, uh, whether the insurance market will open up, or whether it will remain 95% uh, Chinese. Um, so, I mean, that, 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 that result is pretty <laughs> clear to me. Uh, Singapore, by the way, is located in Southeast Asia, which is a great place under, under Chinese influence, under Indian influence somewhat, um, and less so under American influence because the, the, the U.S. in many, um, like in many parts of the world, is withdrawing, uh, sadly, and has less influence on, on the debates and, and on, 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 you know, for example, the South China Sea or the, peninsula, the Korean Peninsula. Uh, but it's interesting that, that Singapore comes number one. Oh, your Paris got 5%. Yeah, I'm we, sorry. We, you, do you yeah. think it's under the food under is, <laughs> and, the, and the nightlife is great? Right. Um, so we might win that one. Um, <laughs> no, the next Franco-German row is bubbling. Would you go with the Frankfurt uh, vote? Uh, well, no, actually, I, th I still think there's going to be a much bigger resurgence in Asia. Um, and you know, we, um, in, in my in my other job as uh, as, as owning and, and chairing a global headhunter, I can tell you we do an enormous amount of work in China, and we are given some really tricky searches. You know, find us people who are you know very experienced and who are Chinese and who can also, by the way, uh, and this, these are real examples from the last year. Can you also find me someone who's also been a practicing lawyer and speaks German, or has been uh, you know has, has a specialist in risk and speaks Russian and yet is ah. Chinese and their first language is China. And you know what? We can find not just one, not just two, but half a dozen of these people to form a shortlist. And there is a phenomenal depth of talent in that country now because there's large quantities of people who have been educated overseas and even work for other countries. And so now they have a very, very strong talent pipeline. Uh, so I don't think that there not are just the barriers. Overseas, also in China. Mm? I mean, the, yeah. the, the, the level of Chinese China. universities is pretty Exactly. The Chinese universities, are, some of them are, the, are world-class universities. And there are lots of them, by the way. I mean, if you want to, a really shocking statistic, go and look how many, how many universities are in Beijing alone. So, um, I, you know, I, I actually don't think that uh, language uh, that Philippe mentioned, and I, don't, I just don't think these are barriers at all. But you didn't vote for Edinburgh. We're not going to tell them that when you get home. <laughs> um, Tim? Yeah, there's some practicalities. You've got to have schools and you've got to have housing, and Frankfurt has neither of those right now. I like Singapore. We it wasn't going to have a sense of humor, which I'm <laughs> some, I sometimes worry is maybe absent as well. I, I, you can't underestimate levity and irony. Oh, poor old uh, I have an office in Singapore. I'm going to Singapore in a few weeks. I think the government there, the MAS, is outstanding. Ravi Menon, outstanding. You've just on the fintech space, they are really, really good. They're, what, you know, they're the smartest people around. If you want to know what's going on in the world, ask the Singaporean government official. I'm a big yeah, fan yeah. of Singapore. Okay, we've got but to I think if I may come say, on, we need to move on, panel, yeah, because I think uh, it's interesting uh, that, that non, non comes third in, in this. Yeah, list. I think yes, that's that is true. I thought that was that's interesting. True. Too. Thank you for that uh, data analysis uh, <laughs> for, for my no left there. Tambi, could you make a case mm -hmm. for India as being uh, sort of underplayed a bit here in, the, in this vote? Uh, well, I actually think it reflects reality. Um, while we often talk about China and India in um, the same breath, uh, at least economically, uh, India is about 10, 10, 15 years behind, um, and it needs kind of a consistent 
And this is why, ideally, Prime Minister Modi would have liked a somewhat more stable world economically and politically around. He's not going to get it, or neither he, if he gets re-elected or his successor, they're not going to get it. Uh, but India is in a different race than China is in. It's, if China has won the economic race for now, India has to do this as a democracy, and as a very diverse democracy. So it's kind of a, doing a triathlon versus a marathon in some sense. Um, so I think you know this accurately reflects, I think, uh, cities in India work, working on some of the challenges now does have some advantages. Um, English-speaking, uh, talented uh, group, good universities, um, and going to do fairly well, even if it's with a slower growth rate than was being uh, anticipated last year, still going to do very well over the next kind of 10, 15 years. It does need to deal with both physical and social infrastructure issues. Um, so I would say this is probably an accurate reflection today, uh, but if we met five years from now, um, I think that you'd see Mumbai go up um, uh, in, you know, on that kind of list. If they'll have us back, we'll find out. As we go into the last 10 minutes or so, I thought it would be, if I was sitting in the audience and I, I have to go back to running a, a business or you know, having a leading role in a, a business by virtue of, of being here, I might be thinking, well, the world is obviously a, a difficult place. We have had these topsy-turvy politics. People can have different views about what they're most worried about, what they're least worried about, what they think they might you know, be able to skirt in their businesses. But they will want to know what matters most. So I'd like you to sort of address it, panel, if you could, from, from that perspective perspective, the practical to-do list, or to-don't list, possibly, that uh, w people might take home with them. So I thought I'd come to you, you on that, Tim, partly because you know, you're know you dealing very practically with finance now, but you have that government experience. We also have those old uh, G20 commitments to financial reform in the background. I mean, that's a long-running uh, album, isn't it? I mean, we have, you know, we're still waiting for it really to be released, but it is bubbling along. It could affect uh, a lot of the sort of flows that are being discussed here at, at Cybos. So what would you be saying to people, you know, make a, to go home, take a note of, talk to, to, their, you know, to, to their colleagues about? With respect to the G20? Yes. Well, you could start with G20, but I think if we were to begin rounding off with what, what is the takeaway here for business finance, I think if people speak to any bit of their expertise. Well, I, th I think I'm banking we're at the end of the post-crisis regulatory agenda. It really is being wrapped up either at the Basel level or at the FSB. And what we see now is some uh, adjustments being made at the domestic level, and that's probably where, where we'll see the activity going forward. Some would accuse the U.S. under this current administration of a race to the bottom. I think that's a mischaracterization. I think it's more about a better balance. But I think the challenge is keeping open and supporting those intermediating institutions, ensuring officials are, are certainly talking with each other so that we keep cross-border capital flows going. Capitalism without capital is just another ism, and we need to ensure that it continues <laughs> to flow everywhere, including you know, the farthest reaches of the global economy. Capitalism without, capitalism without capital, that is a marvelous thought to take day in with us. But, uh, but basically, it's, it's basically just keeping the push on, keep openness. Absolutely. You know, we, well, we also see, we've seen a huge amount of de-risking because of regulatory yes. costs. Some of it is also, you know, the challenge of doing business in a variety of places. But if we want to see global growth, we want to see interconnectivity, then we've got to ensure that capital continues to flow. And what we do see is a fragmentation of balkanization in the global financial system. We need to run against that. Heather? Mm, well, I tell you, my big take out from all of this today is, is probably maybe not what you're all thinking. You know, if any of you have got children or you're uh, or thinking about what careers they should be in the future and think about these million jobs that they need to create in India and things like that, I have realized that the thing that we need to all go into and encourage our children to go into is risk. Okay, so number one, the risk function will be, there are very few women, by the way, represented in risk, and if they are, they're usually in operational risk. Um, so really, we need to put more people into risk and more people, and better quality people into risk functions and encourage people. And the second thing we almost certainly need to do is run around and recruit some more trade negotiators because we are woefully short of them. Great, great career paths yes. opening up. Yeah, I, I, they're I, your two I, top I, tips. I, and, but this is my, my this is really top tips. But this is for the financial system. I'm just thinking yes. about the financial system. Yes. Here. Yes, as you, yeah. you missed out those bits that we always put in our, to try and liven up our reports on automation that says, however, there will be a great market for yoga teachers. <laughs> if, <laughs> if, if, that's, if that's where you want the next part of your career to go, apparently there's a, there's a big shortfall looming. You heard it here first. Um, Philippe, yes, the practical takeaway 
particularly perhaps for, for finance, from this world picture that you've outlined and the, the rise of China and your concerns on China? Well, I think, you know, what, what we, we need to, to, to uh, reinforce our, our, our value system and uh, our values system, I should say, rather, uh, and as well as, as, as the rule of law. And at, at, at the end of the day, I mean, the EU, which, is, which the, you know, the UK, you know, spies at leaving, uh, uh, is, is a, has a set of values that are very strong and it can, it can bring forward uh, the, these values. Um, uh, not that the UK will not have values, but, but certainly, you know, in, in a time of a lot of uh, uh, dysfunctional situations, um, I think uh, th 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 this is something uh, to look for. The other thing is, of course, uh, climate change. Um, and, and for example, I mean, I don't want to be seen as a, as a, as a China basher. I mean, I, there were a couple of questions I felt was mm -hmm. perhaps addressed to me. But one, 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 one subject where certainly the, um, uh, the Europeans and the, and the Chinese can 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 um, engage is 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 climate and unfortunately the United States is, it doesn't really have a very uh, 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 pro environmental policy at the moment that may change in three years hopefully but um, uh, certainly the you know the Europeans and and, and and the Chinese can 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 look forward to to building this this you know from this Paris Agreement and and uh, implement it and would you recommend getting tough on China I mean one way of looking at it is that the international community has been in a way sort of slightly wowed by China, that China opened up a lot faster uh, in many ways, at least in terms of, of trade and business and people coming and going than was expected. And, but what are the, you know, what's in your mind the balance of risks of the, the carrot and the stick when it comes to dealing with Beijing, just so that we can send Mr. Xi some advice from the room here as he goes into his own modestly small Congress? So the idea at the moment within the EU, and I think the, the US is also uh, reviewing the, the CFUS uh, process. CFUS is the Committee on Foreign uh, Investment in the United States. Uh, there's this idea of you know, looking at national security concerns as well as uh, competition issues. Uh, and in, uh, again, I mean, uh, when you have uh, state-owned enterprises uh, buying up some private companies in, in you know, other parts of the world, it's not always uh, a playing fair. So the idea within the EU and, and, and the European Commission president uh, in his uh, State of the Union address in September put forward this sort of, at the moment, non-binding uh, proposal to, to screen some of the uh, you know, investments in, in, in sensitive technologies in particular and some infrastructure. So obviously, you know, uh, it's a, it may be illiberal to propose this kind of screening, but at the, at the same time, you know, if you don't have reciprocity, you may actually want to... And you know, I think there's a bit of a rising interest in that in Germany, isn't there, as it's sort of come Absolute, close into... Absolutely. Into, I think there's we see it everywhere, and I think that's part of the reason we've seen a real fall off in foreign direct investment, trans uh, border uh, FDI. And Correct. you're right, the CFIUS process in the U.S. is really almost stopped uh, foreign investment, certainly from China. I can't imagine any U.S. official who will willingly sign off on a huge China acquisition of a U.S. company. I don't care what it is. The politics are such it makes it almost uh, impossible to do so. Danby. Well, I'll just bring us back to the theme of this panel, kind of the nation-first politics. And I think one of the things that history has shown us is that nation-first politics is not good for global economics or the nations, various nations' concerns, uh, economies. And I think what we need to do is figure out a way as business, as government, um, as kind of analysts, to think about how you make the case for globalization again. Because at the end of the day, each one of these governments, whether democratic, whether non-democratic, is thinking about how do you deliver the goods. Uh, history has shown us globalization helps you do that better, but how do you ensure that that's more consistent across nations? Um, so one set of nations, in this case the West these days, isn't feeling uh, like Asia is eating its lunch. Um, so we don't have this problem down the line. So I think it is kind of how do you go back uh, and make the ca positive case, and in not just make the case, but ensure 
um, that both businesses and governments are figuring out how uh, more people are benefiting for, from and, this. And actually, I would just go piling on the back of that because I think that, as you said earlier, you know, what drives people is the next election, or in many cases in the financial industry, the next financial quarter. Um, and I think that some of the decisions that are made are made because people are looking in the, in the very short term. And let's face it, I was brought up to, to believe that the average fund manager makes a sheep look like a mature and independent thinker. <laughs> and that you absolutely people focus on what is the next person doing and what is the next person doing um, and not actually thinking about the long term, whether it's climate change, whether it's a sound financial system, whether it's the removal of nuclear weapons. These are the things that will give the financial system and will give banks and will give organisations longevity. Uh, what is one thought you might like to leave us with? Tim, the Fed and key economic roles uh, in the United States, do you think they'll be in the same hands when we meet again in a year's time as they are in now? No, it's, it, we're having a huge turnover. Remember, personnel is policy, so you'll have uh, probably at least six and maybe seven, uh, five and probably six new Fed governors and a new chair and, and two new vice chairs. The newest vice chair is a fellow named Randy Quarles, a former colleague of mine who's absolutely fabulous. I don't think Janet Yellen will be reappointed, although she can make a compelling case that she should. Mm -hmm. I think she's done a very good job and she's a capable economist and it would be a very safe pair of hands. But I think this president wants to put his own imprint on the Fed. Those who are being interviewed are actually all pretty outstanding candidates. But let me just, one final word as we wind down. Please. This is the 200th anniversary of David Ricardo's publishing of his famous treaties on the gains from trade. It's one of those uh, laws of economics that have endured for 200 years. We will abandon that at our own peril. You're going to gloss it we for will, me, just, just in case anyone we'll, wasn't quite keeping up in the it, seminar. And this idea that somehow uh, there's a zero sum, there's only a set number of jobs globally, and we're battling over who gets that job is absurd. We gain from trade, we gain, we gain from exchange, and what we have to do is those gains are generalized. What we fail to do is assist those who have lost from that uh, exchange, from that trade, and help them transition to something new. That's what's driving, a part of what's driving politics in so many different places, is a portion of the population that feels they have been left behind, they have been forgotten, and they've lost their sense of dignity. That's a powerful emotion that politicians have tapped into. Absolutely right, and I think it drove a, a lot of, of what we've been talking about now. I know we've done it as a bit of a whistle-stop tour, so there'll be a lot of people thinking, oh, you didn't get to the bit that I care about most. But I, I, I'm sure you would like to thank our, our panel for taking on pretty much every uh, part of the world that was thrown at them for their insights and their humour. Though I am going to say, as a slightly Germanophile chair, if anybody wants to defend Frankfurt and its sense of humour, come and seek me out at lunch, where I will have at least half a joke for you. Um, but please do give them a round of applause to Philippe, Heather, Tim and Tanby. Thank you, Thank you very much. <laughs>